At 45,000 feet, the air is too thin for human survival. The temperature outside is 60 degrees below zero, and yet, cutting through this hostile void is the most recognizable silhouette in aviation history. The cyan blue nose, the Raymond Lowy design, the United States seal emblazoned on the side. To the public, this is Air Force One, a symbol of diplomacy in presidential prestige, but that is a carefully curated image. Strip away the polished exterior and you are not looking at a luxury jet, you are looking at a classified military bunker with wings, a flying command post designed to withstand the opening salvo of a nuclear war. It carries the most powerful person on Earth, the codes to the world's deadliest arsenal, and secrets that the U.S. government has spent billions to protect. What actually happens inside this tube of aluminum? How does it vanish from civilian radar while remaining the most watched object on the planet? And in a world of hypersonic missiles and cyber warfare, can it really survive the unthinkable? Welcome to the classified reality of Air Force One. The first line of defense isn't armor, it is anonymity. Air Force One is not a specific plane, it is a radio call sign attached to any Air Force aircraft the President steps onto. However, the two Boeing 747-200s utilized for this role, designated tail numbers 28,000 and 29,000, are masters of deception. On high-threat missions, the President rarely travels alone. The military often deploys a decoy strategy. Two identical aircraft will taxi to the runway. They may take off within minutes of each other. They may swap transponder signatures in midair. To a terrorist cell tracking flight paths or a hostile nation's radar operator, the target is ambiguous. Which plane holds the commander-in-chief and which one is the ghost? Even the flight crew, the pilots, and navigators are often kept in the dark about the president's specific placement until the motorcade actually pulls up to the stairs. Once airborne, the deception deepens. Air Force One does not squawk a standard identification code. To civilian air traffic control, it is often invisible, a blank space in the sky where a plane should be. The airspace around it is sanitized. A moving bubble of restricted air travels with the jet. Breaching this invisible wall doesn't result in a warning ticket. It results in an immediate intercept by F-16 Fighting Falcons armed with live ammunition. But the plane is only the tip of the spear. Before Air Force One wheels even touch the ground in a foreign city, an invasion has already taken place. Weeks in advance, massive C-17 Globemaster cargo planes land under the cover of diplomatic clearance. They offload the Beast, the President's armored limousine, along with Secret Service tactical teams, counter-assault units, and communications trucks. The airport runway is swept for explosives. Fuel trucks are tested for chemical tampering. In some cases, the Secret Service will bring their own jet fuel, refusing to trust local supplies that could be contaminated to disable the aircraft engines mid-flight. When Air Force One finally descends, it isn't landing at a civilian airport. It is landing in a temporary American fortress constructed inside a foreign nation. Let's talk about the hardware. A standard Boeing 747 is a marvel of engineering. The VC-25A is a marvel of paranoia. The aircraft is heavily modified to survive the specific nightmares of modern warfare. The most terrifying of these is the EMP, an electromagnetic pulse. In the event of a nuclear detonation, the resulting blast releases a wave of energy that fries silicon chimps instantly. Cars stop, cities go dark, planes fall out of the sky. But Air Force One is hardened. Its 238 miles of internal wiring are shielded to withstand this pulse. Its avionics are analog redundant. While the world below plunges into the Stone Age, the electronics on board this ship keep humming. If the threat is more direct, say, a heat-seeking surface-to-air missile, the plane reacts faster than a human pilot ever could. It is equipped with the AN AAQ-24 Nemesis system. 
Sensors detect the exhaust plume of an incoming missile instantly. Computers calculate the trajectory. And then the plane fires a directed infrared countermeasure, a high-intensity laser beam that shoots directly into the missile's seeker head, blinding it and sending it spinning harmlessly away from the aircraft. Flares, chaff, jammers. This is not a passenger jet protecting a VIP. It is a warship protecting the chain of command. Yet the most sophisticated laser defense system in the world is useless if the threat is sitting in the cockpit. The insider threat is the security community's greatest fear. This is why the crew of Air Force One is subjected to the Yankee White security clearance, one of the most intrusive vetting processes in the U.S. government. Background checks go back decades. They interview your elementary school teachers. They scrutinize your finances for a single unexplained deposit. They map your family tree to ensure no distant cousin has ties to a hostile intelligence agency. Only active duty military personnel fly this plane. There are no civilian stewardesses, no contracted janitors. Every person who touches the fuselage has sworn an oath to defend the Constitution. This paranoia extends to the dinner plate. The president's food is not supplied by a catering company. Instead, agents in plain clothes visit random grocery stores in the D.C. area. They select ingredients anonymously. There is no pattern, no schedule. If a terrorist wanted to poison the president's meal, they would have to poison the entire city's food supply to do it. Once on board, the kitchen functions under laboratory conditions. If a vetted chef loses sight of an ingredient for 30 seconds, it is thrown in the trash. In this world, trust is a liability. Inside, the aircraft is divided into 4,000 square feet of floor space across three levels. But this is not a luxury hotel. The layout is a hierarchy of power. The upper deck is the domain of the cockpit in the communication center. The main deck is the president's territory. It houses the flying Oval Office, a conference room, and a private suite. But walk further back and the glamour fades. The rear of the plane is for the press corps and junior staff. They are physically and symbolically separated from the seat of power. And hidden away is a room you hope to never use, the medical annex. This isn't a first aid kit. It is a functioning emergency room with a fold-out operating table, high-intensity lighting, and a fully stocked pharmacy. A military surgeon is always on board. If the president suffers a stroke or a gunshot wound over the Atlantic, the surgery happens at 600 miles per hour. There is no waiting for an ambulance. The ambulance is already flying. The necessity of these features was proven on September 11, 2001. When American airspace became a kill zone, Air Force One did not land. It ascended. With the White House a potential target, the plane became the seat of government. President George W. Bush ran the country from 45,000 feet, communicating with the Pentagon and intelligence agencies through encrypted, jam-proof lines. This is where the aircraft's most crucial capability comes into play. Range. Air Force One has a refueling port on its nose. While commercial jets must land to refuel, Air Force One can meet a tanker in the stratosphere. In a doomsday scenario, where the ground is radioactive or overrun, the president does not need to land. The plane can stay airborne for days or even weeks, Limited only by the consumption of engine oil and the psychological endurance of the crew, it becomes a satellite of survival. But survival is meaningless without command. Boarding the plane just steps behind the president is a military aide carrying a leather satchel known as the emergency action satchel. Colloquially, we call it the football. It is never more than a few feet from the president. Inside are not big red buttons, but a series of authentication codes and war plans, the biscuit. Air Force One is wired to transmit these codes to nuclear submarines deep in the Pacific and silos in the Dakotas. Even if Washington, D.C. is erased from the map, even if the Pentagon is silent, the retaliation can be launched from this chair in the sky. The plane ensures that a decapitation strike against the United States is mathematically impossible. Air Force One is a technological marvel, yes, but it is also a somber reminder of the world we live in. 
We like to imagine that civilization is stable, that our safety is guaranteed. But look closely at this plane. Look at the flares, the jammers, the operating table, the nuclear codes. This aircraft was not built for a world of peace. It was built for a world where everything can go wrong in a heartbeat. So, the next time you see that blue and white giant cruising overhead, don't just admire the engineering. Remember what it represents. It is the ultimate insurance policy for the human race's most dangerous job. And as long as it keeps flying, the lights stay on.